So welcome to the second seminar of uh, this uh, Rifts and Rifted Margins webinar. My name is Sascha Brunner and I'm organizing this uh, webinar with Giacomo Corti, Susan Beuter, Rebecca Bell and Gianreto Manacha. Today's topic is the uh, interaction between rifting and surface processes. And uh, as you see, I brought up a little sketch here from Kawi et al. 2006, just to kick this off a bit where you see how um, the redistribution of mass from the foot wall to the hanging wall changes the pressure and the temperature and uh, essentially affects the deeper part of the rifts as well. And uh, also the sediments, of course, provide a great record of what, what has been going on everywhere within the catchment area. So today we will have three talks that deal with, uh, with this topic. Um, of combining tectonics and surface processes and also climate records from the Gulf of Corinth. Uh, that will be mostly the, the first talk. Then the second talk focuses more on the small scale sediment budget and the role of the catchment lithology. And the last part uh, takes us uh, to uh, deeper parts of the rift by looking at uh, how surface processes affect uh, melting uh, at depth. So uh, I'll ask Lisa to share her screen and then we can start with the first talk. Oh, before I forget uh, to mention this, um, you can type your questions if you have any uh, you, while the talk is, uh, is running. So the speaker won't be annoyed by it. It will just be a small number that pops up somewhere. So uh, if you have any idea, just uh, type it in there and then we uh, can discuss about this afterward. Thanks. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, hopefully you can see the presentation. Yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for the invitation um, to join you here and, and give some um, brief results on, on uh, work we've been doing in the current thrift. It's a great pleasure. Um, so this is work um, over quite a number of years with lots of different colleagues, um, but most recently we've had um, a scientific ocean drilling IDP expedition in the Corinth Rift. So this has really added to our knowledge. So the focus here, I'm going to try and focus it on surface processes as that's your, that's the, your topic, and we're mostly going to be looking at what we find in the sink, as in in the, the, in the rift basin itself but I will touch on some elements of the tectonics um, processes going on as well. So we're interested in the early rift phase. Um, by studying young active rifts, it gives us the potential for understanding early rift processes at very high resolution and without the overprinting that we would have for older systems. And there are a few continuous long records existing and rates tend to be poorly constrained because there's a lack of chronology. So for example, really getting at tectonic strain rates and also sediment flux rates. As you probably know, the typical environment um, changes from a terrestrial to a lacustrian to a marine sequence. And we have all of that present in the current rift that we're studying here. And we know that fault displacement and the fault network and how it changes is going to control the subsidence and the positions of the deeper centers. And then finally, we know that there's combinations of climate and tectonics and probably sea level influence um, controlling the flux of sediment into the basin. But what factor dominates and does this change through time? So I've got some just some general figures here. You can see on the left um, the evolution of the rift and we're really looking at the, the sort of top two um, parts of this phase in the Corinth Rift, it's very young, and at the bottom just some nice cartoons illustrating how the environment changes from predominantly terrestrial through to lake and finally um, we get to marine systems later. So why study the Corinth Rift? Um, sorry, I'm just going to put those away. Great. Um, so this is an area with really high strain rate. So you can see uh, figures here showing um, the Aegean region um, with earthquakes and we can see a concentration of earthquakes in the Gulf of Corinth area here. And also you're seeing GPS um, uh, vectors on the right hand side. So up to 15 to 20 millimeters a year in fact. So some of the highest extension rates on earth and high levels of seismicity. It's also a very young rift, um, so about sort of five million years in total, but the recent phase only began about two million years ago. So it's got a relatively simple tectonic history. Um, there are high sedimentation rates, and we've also got a nice sea level reference frame. So there's a real potential for high resolution here. 
the Sin Reef sediments are well preserved, particularly offshore in the Gulf of Corinth itself. And we have a self-contained, closed, um, relatively small rift system. So there's a potential to characterize the entire tectonic and sedimentary rift system in one place. So it's really a unique setting for studying early rift processes. And that's why lots of us have been working here for, for many years. Okay, sorry. Okay, um, just a few um, images just to show you what it looks like if you haven't been there before. We have some wonderful Gilbert Fan deltas on the rift margin. These were formerly obviously submarine, but they're now being uplifted in the, uh, in the footwall of active faults as those have stepped north. And so we're seeing some of the Sinrift, um, earlier Sinrift deposits exposed on shore. Um, and you can see similar um, finer grain deposits in the lower figure. Um, we also have a prominent active southern shore fault system which is really controlling this geomorphology. We know that there are strong sea level effects here um, and also we can use those to generate an initial chronology. So this is quite a lot of work that's been done pre-drilling and this is based a lot on the really extensive seismic network that we have within the rift. So the basin um, is surrounded by um, sills that are basically isolating the basin during low stands. So we have an alternating marine and isolated or lacustrine basin environment as sea level fluctuates. So we can, um, and those have actually been um, verified at least for the last cycle from shallow piston cores. And we see a seismic stratigraphic um, signal from this too. And so we've been able to, and many have done this as well, been able to make a tie to those glaciostatic cycles to come up with an estimated chronology but we really don't have anything constraining that beyond um, a few tens of thousands of years until the drilling. And we know that there's three phases of rifting or three main phases of rifting and the most recent two of those are likely preserved offshore. So on the top right you can see um, the location of, of the rift um, and in fact you can see the three drill sites that we drilled and the main sort of sill areas are here to the west that are controlling this, this fluctuation at the moment. And at the bottom you can see an example of a seismic profile and the most recent phase of deposition, which is the most recent ref phase, has got this nice alternating and um, seismic characteristics, um, which Becky and, and others have, have correlated to this, this probable um, marine um, lake kind of signal. So that gave us a preliminary um, time scale. So what are we trying to do overall? We're trying to improve our ground truthing. I actually collect some samples and the chronology of the offshore sin rift sequence and to do that at high temporal resolution, hence ITP drilling. And then we want to integrate that chronology and the depth constraints with our seismic stratigraphy um, and that's been able to allow us to generate um, and map out the sin rift epicenters um, and fault networks and I'll show you some work that Casey Nixon and also Rebecca Bell have done in the past. So we've mapped those out from a dense seismic network, giving us high spatial resolution. And then the aim is to then feed those results into onshore um, and modeling studies of both the earlier rift sequences and surface processes. And so ultimately, hopefully, we can get at an evolution of a rift controlled closed drainage system in time and space at tens of thousands of years timescales, and hopefully therefore unravel the relative roles of tectonics and climate on sediment flux and basin environment. And finally, um, another important part that I'll spend less time on today, we want to establish the fault and rift structural evolution of an, an active continental rift at high resolution. And a lot of that's been done already, but now we have the sort of um, the absolute chronology to really help us do that. So this is a map showing you the, uh, the Corinth rift and the primary faults, sorry. Um, and this is uh, compiled from all of the seismic data that's been collected from the 1980s through to the 2000s. So integrating that to develop a sort of continuous fault map, horizon map, and establish the units. And you can see the density of the seismic data down here in the map. And then integrating that with our drilling results. So you can see the three drill sites. So two in the main Gulf of Corinth and one in the Alcanides Gulf in the east. Um, and this was from IDP Expedition 381, which took place in 2017 and 18 on a ship called the Fugro Synergy. And we had to use this ship because there were basically bridge restrictions at either end of the Gulf that presented the, prevented the Joy's resolution gaining access. So three sites were drilled, cored and logged. And I'm going to show you some of the results from these and, and some of the initial integrations into the seismic data. 
So our first drill site was this one. This is on a, a horse block. So we're getting a con relatively condensed section in the Gulf of Corinth, capturing two of the, the rift phases. Um, so drilling as deep as we could get. So here we reached about 600 meters below seafloor. And then we also had a companion site, Site 79, where we looked at a more expanded section of that most recent rift phase. So here we were drilling down to 700 meters below seafloor. So I'm going to show you some results um, that relate to those two sites, first of all. So sure enough, we found that indeed we could break down um, the units in this most recent phase into marine and isolated or lake subunits. And they were quite distinctive in terms of their lithologies and also the uh, microfossil assemblages that we found. Um, so the marine lithologies, it was more common to find homogeneous mud, which turned out to be heavily biotubated. Um, and the microfossils were a combination of marine and terrestrial microfossils present. Whereas in the isolated subunits, um, laminated sediments were more common, um, although they were also present in the marine units. And we're looking at very thin beds. Um, and not surprisingly, in this sort of more lake environment, the non-marine microfossils, including non-marine mic diatoms, were much more abundant and low abundances of marine microfossils. But interestingly, in both the marine and the isolated environments, we were never really finding truly marine or freshwater assemblages. And then as we got into the earlier um, unit, the earlier rift phase, we didn't find this fluctuation, which had been a prediction we had from the seismic data. Things were much more homogeneous, also biotubated, um, but mostly non-marine microfossils present. So probably the rift is either sitting above sea level at this point, or maybe protected by shallow abounding sills. And just a general note on the sediments, um, the fine, uh, the dominant sediments were fine-grained and thin turbiditic and hemipelagic sediments. Um, sorry, just back to here. One thing that was really notable was the nature of the transitions between these marine and sort of isolated subunits. So you often had this, this quite sort of complex um, series of, of darker laminated mudbeds that represented the transition from, in this case, marine to isolated. So really quite distinctive um, showing that transition. In the eastern part of the rift, we drilled a site, uh, site 80, in the Alcanides Gulf. And here we've got much lower subsidence and sediment accumulation rates. And here we found a really interesting alternating marine, lake and terrestrial environment sequence over at least the last two to three million years and potentially back to the late Miocene. So we've got a really um, quite complicated interplay here of tectonic subsidence, fault activity, sea level and probably changes in the basin opening and sills. And here we're only drilling to about 500 metres below seafloor, so it was quite um, distinct changes over a relatively short interval. So the earlier rift phase is, is recorded, uh, and this possibly is one that extends on shore, and this is down in this unit here, where we actually found a return to marine sediments. We're also seeing here a strong signature of the source lithologies. Um, so not just the, the dominant limestone, but we're also seeing ophiolite materials coming into the basin. So just having a look at the sequence in the upper part, the most recent part, we still see this marine isolated um, alternating sequence. But as we get back into the lower part of unit two, um, we start seeing some really nice shallow marine assemblages. And then we reverted into a series of terrestrial alluvial fan and fluvial deposits with really quite distinctive um, oxidized um, coloration. And then, as I said before, back into another marine basin. So clearly some big changes here and then finally we reach basal conglomerate so pretty much reaching the the base of the basin at this at this location so a really interesting site i'm doing very well with my arrows late better late than never <laughs> okay so from taking that and particularly focusing on that expanded um, site, Site 79, we looked in detail at what's been going on in the most recent rift phase and particularly looking at the links to these glacial yeast static cycles. We found, in summary, really distinctive lithologies and physical properties of those lithologies between the marine and the isolated subunits. And as I said before, highly complex and really varied microfossil, microfossil assemblages reflecting changing basin environment. I should note that the basin is underfilled today and we think that extends back some time. So clearly the tectonic subsidence here exceeds sediment supply, even at very high rates. So in the marine or high stand or interglacial periods, we have relatively low sediment accumulation rates, um, so less than a millimetre a year. 
and the palynology data that we have indicates there was mixed forest on the rift flanks and that's probably reducing the sediment supply into the rift. The Holocene is an exception and this has high sediment accumulation rates which you can see over here the sedimentation rates are this right hand plot I should have noted. Um, and so we think that's probably anthropogenic effect in the last thousands of years with um, removal of vegetation. The turbidite frequency is relatively low and there appears to be some correlation of reduced sand input during these marine phases. Biotubation is high, that's this column here, um, and also more diverse microfossils. Whereas in the isolated low stand glacial periods, we have much higher sediment accumulation rates, so two to seven times higher. Um, and these are up to three to four millimeters a year in the thickest similar section, so pretty high rates. And the palynology indicates here that the vegetation is different and also reduced, so more commonly open grasslands, so probably allowing increased erosion and sediment supply. Turbulent frequency seems to be higher, so maybe a climatic effect here and possibly increased sand as well. Here's some examples of, of that signal. And biotubation is low, which is maybe not surprising because of the less diverse assemblages. So linking that into the seismic data, these are isopac um, maps, or actually in time, isochrons, that were put together by Casey Nixon and published in 2016 and being updated now. Um, and these show you over several different time periods how the rift deepercenters have changed. So we've got the earlier rift phase here, and then we have the most recent rift phase bro broken down into three um, unequal in time phases. And so what you see here, and, and now what we're able to do is update the timing with our chronology and also velocity data with our time to depth conversion from drilling gives us much better constraints now on these isopacks and our sediment fill rates and distribution through time. So in that earlier phase, the sediments were deposited in two distinct 20 to 50 kilometer long deeper centers. But in the more recent phase, these three diagrams here, there's been a switch in rift polarity so the fault polarity has become, um, it was more equal um, and more asymmetric, uh, sorry, more symmetrical. Um, now we've got a more symmetrical um, system and we've got development of this southern border um, rift fault system. And that linkage of that system has also led to linkage of the deeper centre into a single simpler 80 kilometre deeper centre. So now we can take these isopacks and compare them directly with the model sediment supply into the rift basin. I'm sure we'll hear a bit more about that from Stephen in a moment. So this is something that's been worked on by him and, and Sophia Peklavinadu and others. So in conclusion, the Corinth Rift has an unprecedented combined geophysical and geological data set from unraveling these early rift processes. And we should be able to do that at very high resolution. We're further developing the chronology um, so new age data are still being added from the drilling results, but we can already see that tectonic subsidence, fault activity, sea level and climate are in interacting to generate major fluctuations in the basin pale environment and sediment accumulation. And specifically, we see that the sediment accumulation rates are high and even higher in glacial periods, probably due to this change in vegetation cover and possibly some other effects on turbidite frequency that we're seeing too. So there's clear evidence of climate and potentially sea level controls and sedimentation but superimposed on this background tectonics, which is sort of controlling the subsidence of the basin. And we see the rift of 50% is simplifying and merging through time um, as the rift structure evolves and as the border fault system develops. And thank you and acknowledgements to all of my colleagues. I shall stop sharing. Thank you very much. Uh, so far we don't have a question. But uh, I would have one. You mentioned very briefly that uh, you had um, you, you were suspicious about the human impact on the sedimentation rate for the last uh, for the last time period. Yes. What makes you so? What kind of indicators do you have to? to, to yeah. So we um, we we have indications that the certainly the sediment accumulation rates are high that they're kind of equivalent to the glacial periods, which is in contrast to others. And there are not studies that we've done, but other studies in the area have indicated evidence that vegetation was drastically changed as soon as there started to become human influence in the area. So it kind of fits fairly well that those changes in the landscape could potentially have led to the same sorts of effects that we've been seeing in the, in the glacial periods, which were more climatic um, driven. So those are from other studies, but there does seem to be good evidence for that. Do you, do you see similar evidence in other areas of the world? Uh, that's a good question. Um, 
I think that there are there's a number of other lake studies in the Mediterranean which probably see some similar results but I suppose one of the advantages of this area here is it's got a very long human occupation so it has the potential to have an impact um, I think the the effect they think is probably over the last 6,000 years relative to say you know we were looking at a, a 12,000 year interval so I guess you need a fairly extensive length of time of um, human impact to to have an effect. Okay, thanks. We have one question from uh, Laura. Laura, can you unmute yourself and ask yourself? Um, sure. Uh, so I was just asking if you'll have any constraints on some of the smaller scale or shorter time scale fault interaction, and if you have any comments on what that may look like with respect to that kind of development of asymmetry in the rift. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Um, Casey Nixon um, published a paper where um, before the drilling, um, with our kind of estimated ages, we were able to look at how long that, that sort of ace, that transition from symmetry to asymmetry took place. And it looks like it's only over a few hundred thousand years, which is actually fairly quick. Um, but certainly in terms of um, higher resolution, we think with the drilling data that we have and the correlation to the seismic data and the reflections, we should be able to get down to thousands of years, potentially, um, but at least sort of 10,000 10, year time scale. So we should be able to look at that sort of level in terms of fault slip rate changes and, and fault interactions. So that's kind of to come. Casey's doing some work on that already and others in the, in the science party. But yes, there's a lot of potential there. Another question from uh, Julia. Julia, do you ask yourself? Or do you want me to go ahead and ask it and answer it? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of nice to hear people's voice. It would be, yeah, yeah. Is Julia there? Uh, yeah, that's my wife's name. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Um, uh, my name is Jonathan Weiss uh, from University oh, of Potsdam. Hi, hi everybody. I was just wondering the, if the drilling has confirmed or refuted sort of the first order sea level stratigraphic correlations from Taylor, Nixon, et cetera. Does it look like that that's holding up? Yes, yeah, so that's a good question. So as you know, um, there were kind of like three or four different interpretations of how many sea level cycles or 100,000 year cycles there were in this upper unit. Um, and more or less it works. When we get down into the lower part, um, it looks like there the interpretations were maybe off a little bit. I actually think actually the Taylor, I seem to remember the Taylor et al one might have been correct in terms of numbers, <laughs> but, but the correlation gets a little bit tricky because there are less distinctive marine intervals. But yes, it's been broadly, um, broadly um, confirmed, but slightly different to some of those interpretations. So. Um, it was good to drill to confirm, but generally those ideas have held up. But it is interesting seeing this earlier phase um, is, is not quite as distinct. Thanks, Lisa. I'm sure that Taylor will be happy to hear be over the that comment. 